Okay, this video is a little bit different. If you're looking for quick tips and fast talking tutorial, then this isn't for you. I'm discovering every day just how YouTube works and social media and all that sort of stuff. And I realise that sometimes people may be in hospital or they may be off work and they have time on their hands and they'll watch whole series of videos. So this one really is quite ad lib. As you can see these are some images of uh, a chair design being woven. It's a prototype for a chair, one of my designs called the Tilt Rock Rocker. And I've got some footage and what I'm doing is it's about 20 minutes. Uh, that's how long the footage is. I'm not sure whether I'll condense this down but let's say bottom line you've got 20 minutes to spare. What I'm going to share in this video, uh, let's turn the sound off for a moment. What I'm going to share in this video is the thought processes as much as anything about designing and making a piece of furniture. So I'm going to start off first of all with the, oh you can see here, the um, variety of equipment I, I, I've got. I've got for instance a metal working milling machine that I use for woodworking. I mean why not? The the RPM is a little bit low but it's like um, you know it's like an overhead router uh, with a lot of very simple and firm control. So uh, what was I saying? Completely lost my track. Uh, here I am making the prototype and I'm kind of designing it as I go along. This is one of the things that I start with a concept and yes, what I was going to say is that, to quote Ron and Arad, a furniture designer whose rover chair famously featured in Jeremy Clarkson's Top Gear program, he said to me when I made a film about him back in 1990, he said, It's never enough for me to do a chair that's a variation on another chair, or just that, that it's a little more elegant than other chairs, or... I, to do a new chair you have to have a very good idea to do, a very good reason to do a new chair. You know, a chair is probably more interesting than any other item of furniture because it's so personal. You sit in it, you relate to it, we all have different ideas of comfort. Now here I'm using my, one of my bandsaws, my largest bandsaw which I can cut, I can deep cut, even deep cut veneer. But here I'm deep cutting some oak. And I used some English oak that I was given by the late Andrew Vara, furniture maker, who was a friend of mine from Shoreditch College in London. Sadly passed away a few years ago, but he gave me in 1976 some prime quality flitch cut oak. Now that is the board that's used for oak veneer. And um, because it's got the marks of the machine embedded in it, it's, it's the last cut, if you like, of the bacon that's attached to the bacon slicing machine. So here I am cutting some laminates. Ah, that's my doorbell, I'm gonna to have to put it on hold. Okay, I'm resuming again. That was my uh, doorbell with another amazingly swift Amazon delivery. Now you can see here the form of the chair. So this is the real thing, this isn't the prototype. Until I've completed the design, I won't know whether it works. It's all very well designing on a drawing board and using CAD and all the rest of this set up, but at the end of the day a chair's got to look right, that's why I'm rotating it. I'm trying to see what it looks like from different angles, because you can make a chair look good from the front or the side, but does it look good from the back? And often, um, for instance, dining chairs are viewed from the back uh, as you approach the dining table. So this is called the Tilt Rocker and this is one of my small workshops, very basic tools. I'm not a woodworking snob, a lot of my tools are very cheap. There are, there's one of the smallest band saws you can get, which I use for certain things. You can see my workshop's rather untidy. Well, that's just the way it is. I know of woodworkers, I won't mention any names but they don't have a single wood shaving on the floor and I think they've got a problem there <laughs> but that's just my opinion. Uh, what I will say is that I tidy the workshop when the workshop's about a foot deep in sawdust and wood shavings and I can't find my tools because they're buried on the floor. No I'm only joking. 
Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm working out how the leaf spring attaches. So it's quite tricky woodworking. You know, the geometry is absolutely crucial. And of course, the leaf spring idea I'm copying from uh, those wonderful Morris Thousand cars and other cars that had leaf spring rear suspension. So that's another thing about designing. You're, you're not totally original. You're drawing from ideas from nature, from technology, from other disciplines. Uh, that's the fun of it. All within the restraints of what wood will do and more importantly what the tools will do. And of course here we're now looking at my favourite tool, the incredible router. There you are, that's a little DeWalt. I've um, got more routers than I've had hot breakfast. You know, for the first four years of my woodworking career, I couldn't even borrow 50 quid. I had just one second-hand radial arm saw, a load of tools. And then when I became reasonably well-known as a woodworking author, and we're going back to uh, uh, the 80s now, uh, I then found uh, the manufacturers would supply me with tools in return, of course, for promotion. I mean, things have changed a lot today. Uh, and of course a lot of the current manufacturers don't know who I am, but back in my day I was probably one of the best known uh, furniture makers, woodworkers in, in uh, Britain. And that raised another issue, this whole thing about modesty. I, I made a film called Why I'm a Better Cabinet Maker Than Thomas Chippendale and I got a torrent of abuse. People totally offended and insulted that I dare blow my own horn. Actually I, what I was saying was that Thomas Chippendale used short grain and you couldn't get away with that today and it's nothing to do with uh, well we've got superior tools today short grain is a characteristic in wood irrespective of time <laughs> and evolution of technology but I was really roasted for blowing my own horn but actually I was blowing the horn of modern makers there are lots of makers as competent as I am but so many people are so entrenched in some romantic idea that they were better in the past. Well, they're not. The work that's going on today, and I have documented it, is, um, is clearly superior. And if you're in business, the first thing you learn is to promote yourself. So I've got that off my chest. And you can see here that I'm using this wonderful oak and using a combination of hand tools and, and small power tools. So another aspect of my philosophy is small is beautiful. I have a tiny workshop, actually I've got three small workshops. You can hardly swing a cat in them, but I always argue that a piece of furniture at the end of the day has got to get in the back of a van and through a domestic door which is about 30 inches wide. So I have built, you know, uh, 50 foot long conservatories, all in components. I built kitchens that I've then ferried from my workshop uh, up to London to fit uh, in London flats and they've all had to fit in the back of a van so having a small workshop is not only um, cheaper to run but it's a tremendous discipline to designing and that's the thing about designing it's not just an artistic whim it's a very very strict discipline and probably for every hundred skilled craftsmen, there's probably only one who's got design flair. I mean, that's just the way it is. I don't think I'm being boastful. I just think I've been given a gift for thinking outside the box and combining a traditional training. I never, I never actually trained as a designer, but I had a good, probably the best training in traditional skill. And what I did, really, in a, in a word, was I rebelled. I rebelled against tradition. I rebelled of being, against being told how I should make something, what joints I should use, why should I have to use dovetails, why use mortise and tenons. Of course, I do use mortise and tenons, and I cut them with a router, if they are the most appropriate tools. Now, here's my friend Gary. Uh, well, who's a fellow a really guitarist, good Gary, and I asked um, him his opinion about now. the evolution uh, of his chair. Got any other brain waves about the corner of the seat? Uh, yeah, you said you're going to use these curvatures, but personally thinking, I think you need to keep it straight. 
because it'll match the top part of the um, chair, the handle. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right, Gary. And architecturally, I think it'd be more visualised. Yeah, I thought you were just a guitarist. You're talking about architecture and helping me design my chair. But it just proves how difficult it is and how organic it is because, um, you know, you've just kind of come into the workshop to see how it was progressing and I had a real problem there and that just one brainwave about which way the curve should go has really helped move this chair on to the next stage. Thanks, Gary. All right, so um, where are we at? Uh, a lot of careful geometry. We're looking at which way the front rail should and should then, curve in or out. Piece. You see, by designing as you go it's along, good. you can make much yeah. better judgments about the way it looks and oh, how yeah, technically it's going to go together. Sorry. So it's a lot of fun, but of course a prototype and a one-off is a very expensive way of making furniture. It's only when you make repeats, you know, batch furniture, that you can really rationalise a design. And in fact, later this month, I'm giving a lecture with Andrew Lawton, who I've made a film about on my YouTube channel. He and I are delivering a lecture in London called The Furniture Designer Maker Product or Service. And he serves, he has a client-based service approach, whereas I've always been fascinated by product. But of course, this particular chair it would not be repeatable. It's too difficult. It's too, it's too uh, tricky. I mean, it would be very hard to copy this chair. So it's a one-off. The chair eventually sold to one of my patrons, but it was a speculative piece. You know, they bought it as seen. You know, they sat in it, they tried it out, and they said, yeah, we like it, and we negotiated a price. As I say, I'm, ad I'm ad-libbing this video. It's about 18 minutes long, so... Uh, we're about three quarters of the way through, I think. And all I'm doing is I'm stringing all the footage together and looking at, looking at it on my monitor and then just saying whatever comes into my head. Like, for instance, here, I'm using some very thin strips of wood to simulate the way I'm going to weave the chair. And I might say that my novel um, tennis racket upholster technique dates back to 1973 when I wasn't a skilled upholsterer and I just had a DIY Black & Decker drill and I would weave my uh, famous rocking chairs um, using this very very simple method and it creates a lovely skeletal form. Now uh, Prince Charles requested a royal family viewing, actually it was the late Prince Princess Diana who did this and out of 10 pieces of British Furniture. Two of mine were selected for a royal family viewing in around about 1985. And he was reported to have sat on one of my rocking chairs and said two rather startling things. One was, I didn't realise this sort of thing was going on in this country. Now that was back in 1985. And the other thing is, he said, oh, it's a bit hard on the bum, isn't it? Well, I've sold over 300 of my rocking chairs and most of my clients put a cushion on it when they use it and then take the cushion off when they uh, want to look at the chair as a piece of sculpture. Come on. Uh, one of the interesting things about my work is that I fall flat on my face trying to sell it to people who aren't tuned in. For people who are tuned in, and they are in a minority, of course they are, in terms of clients, I don't have to sell at all. They automatically tune in to my style of work. They understand what I'm trying to achieve in furniture and the fact that it's not an artistic whim. It's very much drawn from tradition because I've studied tradition. I wrote uh, Furniture Today, the series, which are now online videos of contemporary furniture against a backcloth of furniture dating right back to the 12th century. I was even commissioned by royalty to create a wine cooler to go in a great hall, one of the oldest great halls in England, and my piece that I designed in the year 2000 sat against pieces of furniture dating back to the 12th century. I mean, that is incredible, and 
you know, when I think most of my furniture making career, people were prejudiced, thinking that, oh, modern is so alien to antiques. And that was just within the same century. But people don't batter an eyelid when a 16th century piece sits next to a 12th century, you know, four centuries apart. Now, fortunately, and rather predictably, since the millennium, attitudes have changed. In fact, we're probably undergoing the most rapid change in society ever, uh, triggered by technology. But her whole, I mean, they're calling this the age of protest. Everything is being questioned. I mean, some of you watching this will be questioning, oh, he's using black cord. Why isn't he using yellow cord? Or why is he using cord in the first place? and that everybody's got an opinion about what is good design or bad design. And maybe this is a good thing, but it also leads to a lot of confusion. I actually think there are fundamental principles to a piece of design. Now here I am, these are the last closing images, so in the last few seconds, just to say, here is the finished chair. I think I oiled it, I can't remember, or maybe I used a matte polyurethane. And as Ron Arad said, a chair should have a very good reason for being. Uh, there you are, you can see the medallary ray on the English oak and the subtlety of a matte finish. What more is there to say other than thank you for watching this ad lib video and please add a comment. If you think it's mad and quirky then say so but all I ask you to be is just respectful and respect would. <laughs>